Greetings, everyone. My name is Juanita Dawson, Executive Council Member of AARP California, and I want to thank you all for attending this conversation hosted by AARP California. We're recognizing Black Music Appreciation Month this year with a month-long menu of activities we want you not only to register for, but also invite your family and friends to register and for everyone to attend and enjoy together. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization for people 50 plus whose vision is for a society in which all people live with dignity and purpose and fulfill their goals and dreams. In California, we're focused on developing livable communities for all ages. To learn more about the work AARP is doing at the national, statewide, and local levels, visit www.aarp.org forward slash CA. If you're interested in learning how you can team up with other 570 volunteers across the state, email us at cavolunteer at aarp.org. We're kicking off our month-long conversation series with Michael Dolphin an executive council member with AARP California and longtime Los Angeles area resident. As a member of our executive council, Michael advises staff on the programmatic direction of AARP California State Office. He's the chairperson of the Veterans, Military and Their Families Advisory Committee. And we welcome you to this very important kickoff to our first Black Music Appreciation Month activities for AARP California. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Juanita. And let me say, it's such a delight to serve with you on the Executive Council uh, and you have as a colleague. It, it has been a joy since the day you first walked into the room. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss something that's very important to me for uh, a number of reasons, uh, all of them very positive. Uh, to talk about the impact of black artists in the music industry from as far back as I know, uh, and some things that I've studied as well and not been so personally involved in. But I'm looking forward to the conversation today and the rest of this month when we have conversations with the founding members of Club Nouveau uh, from the Sacramento area, the accomplished jazz pianist Tammy Hall from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and a good friend of mine, the inimitable Mr. Leroy Downs, as they share their personal and collective experiences in the music industry. And those artists, past and present, uh, who've had an impact on their careers and, and uh, on their lifestyle and, and, and everything surrounding the music as well, and their artistry. Uh, we want people to visit www.aarp.org backslash BMM to find out more and access the unique content in Wow, thank you so much, Michael. Let's just jump right in. And I wanna ask you to tell us a little bit about the Black Music Appreciation Month and the role music, specifically Black music, has played in your life. Well, I, I won't start the controversy. It's one month <laughs> out of 12 months. And as far as I'm concerned, it's every single day. Uh, and if we could get more days in the year, I would make them all Black Music Month because black music is so ingrained in, in our society and so much ingrained in everything that we do surrounding who we are as black people, where we've been as black people, where we're going as black people. And I'd say even to communicate among each other, to tell our stories, uh, to give, I mean, music is art. And, and, and a lot of the music is an insight of who we are and where we come from. Um, so much so that, that people will often hear me say uh, that the two things I love about black music are gospel and blues. Uh, because those are the two genres of music that are always about the truth and are always about how people feel. Um, and unfortunately, you, know, you can tell when it comes to talking about this stuff for me, it's like turning on a faucet. And sometimes it's hard to turn me off. But <laughs> there's so much. There's so much. 
I know. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about growing up um, around the L.A. jazz scene? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I, I hate to say that it, that it's a secret. Maybe it's as, as 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 little known because of who Los Angeles is as compared to New York, or compared to New Orleans, or compared to Memphis. Uh, Los Angeles had its own renaissance during the 40s and the 50s um, that contributed so much to the world of jazz. There was a high school here in Los Angeles, um, Thomas Jefferson High School, which just celebrated its 100th birthday uh, a couple of years ago, and who hired as a music teacher the first black educational teacher in the LA Unified School District in 1946 named Sam Brown. Sam Brown was an accomplished musician and violinist who had already established his own significant reputation as a child prodigy and as an educator in the world of classical music and who was very well known in many, many venues as just an accomplished musician who decided to teach and who then went on to Thomas Jefferson High School. Uh, and his time there, his tenure there was, was more productive than you would ever believe. Uh, Thomas Jefferson High School graduated Dexter Gordon. Uh, it, and, oh, good Lord, the, the list is so long, and I, I sometimes, unless I print it out for myself, I forget. But um, the number of folks who started there, uh, Chico Hamilton, Dexter Gordon, the uh, uh, the Braxton brothers who went on to be in the Duke Ellington Orchestra uh, and the rock and roll people who started there, the rhythm and blues people who started at Jefferson High School. It's just an incredible, incredible list of folks. I encourage you to go look at it. It's it, it's all up here. It's, there's so much up here that sometimes even I can't pull it out on, on the spur of a moment. But because of that, because of the Charlie Parkers in Los Angeles and the Buddy Collettes in Los Angeles and the Charles Minguses in Los Angeles during that time, and because what we refer to as Central Avenue was segregated, we did create kind of our own Harlem Renaissance here on the West Coast. Jazz clubs grew up on Central Avenue because we were not welcome in other parts of the city. When my father came here in 1948, to begin the music business. And he showed up from Detroit with a pocket full of money, my dad believed in cash, um, with a pocket full of money and Dolphins of Hollywood already in his head. And he started looking for a place in Hollywood because he knew Hollywood was the place he wanted to be. And every time a real estate agent showed up to show him a place and they saw who he was, they decided not to rent to him. And eventually he wound up on Central Avenue around the corner from the Club Alabama and the Last Word and the Dunbar Hotel and Ivy's Chicken Shack, opened his place on Vernon and Central, and he still named it Dolphins of Hollywood. And someone once asked, well, you're not in Hollywood. Why did you choose that name? And my dad's answer was, I'm not in Hollywood yet. And Dolphins of Hollywood in that location in Central Avenue in that burgeoning, absolutely incredible community became a record shop, a recording studio. Mm -hmm. My dad created three record labels connected with both the shop and the recording studio. And KGFJ began to broadcast out of the front window, which led to so many other things around what Central Avenue is. Mm -hmm. that they're just an incredible legend. Oh, wow. But, Very. but only because the music was there. Okay. Because <laughs> the music was there. Yeah, I was going to say very, very interesting background. And uh, you gave us a lot about Dolphins of uh, Hollywood and, and your family's impact. Uh, can you just give us a little bit more about the Los Angeles uh, expanded area and beyond and the impact of uh, Dolphins of Hollywood? Just tell us a little bit more about the expanded area. 
Sure. Uh, well, I, I also want to be all inclusive. I, 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 I do think of Dolphins of Hollywood, my dad, as part of the part of the, the the entire picture of Central Avenue and not just the picture of Central Avenue. Uh, as a black businessman during that time in the music business, but still collaborating with others who talked about not just the business side of the music, but also beginning to try to understand how the music industry not only used the circumstance to grow and flourish because it was Central Avenue, but also to be able to understand what it was going to take to make that inroad into Hollywood. As, as one example, until 1956, in Los Angeles, there was a Black Musicians Union and there was a White Musicians Union. And the Black Musicians Union existed on Central Avenue, on 38th and Central. Um, and what happened during that period of movies and music and television shows is that the contractors went to the white musicians union to get those musicians and every now and then reached over to the other side if they couldn't find an oboe player or they couldn't find a violin player you know when they normally had to and then lucy and desi came along and lucy and desi hired buddy collette to be, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've got to go back a minute. Not Lucy and Desi this time, but Groucho Marx came along and Groucho Marx decided to hire Buddy Collette as his musical arranger for his television show. And then Groucho opened the door for Buddy and then Buddy became friends with Lucy and Desi. And then Buddy talked Lucy and Desi to hire Marlon Young another black musician as their musical arranger. It wasn't just the fact that these are musicians who were playing in clubs and they sounded good and you know they could party and all. These were distinguished, educated musicians. Both Buddy and Marlon Young had degrees from UCLA music program and Buddy became an instructor at USC. But because they had not just the chops, but the education to be able to read charts, write charts, and conduct, Lucy Adesi and Groucho says, we want to give them this opportunity, and they did. And what became what came out of that was Marlon Young and Buddy Collette became the driving forces to amalgamating the Black Music Union and the White Musician Union. And that happened, and they were not lawyers, but they were educated. They had the backup of a lot of Hollywood, and they were able to amalgamate those music, those unions and create local music union number 47 in 1956 and change the lives of musicians all over Los Angeles and literally all over the country and open those doors to Hollywood and to those recording sessions to Capitol Records and to uh, Nelson Riddle for Plas Johnson and a number of other folks because of Central Avenue, they were able to develop and teach and learn and, and to take advantage of what Central Avenue was during those days. Now I can tell you, even in this few minutes, I've got books like this on Central Avenue and the history of Central Avenue. I could do this for hours only because <laughs> I, I realize how important it is. And, and for me, and for me, I don't know that I ever intended to be this historian, mm -hmm. and I don't think of myself as a historian, but I think what's really important that somebody has to talk about it. Yeah. And if we don't talk about it, it's our fault. Mm -hmm. Because there, there are roots. There are roots there that were created in the late 40s and through the 50s that are totally responsible for where we are today and the opportunity that it's created today. Yeah, this is so wonderful, Michael. Um, we do have a few pictures and I think we have video. I uh, want to let you um, kind of give us some more historical background here as we show a couple of pictures. Uh, we want you to tell us what was going on during this time. So um, let's see. Let's see a couple of pictures. What's going on here? What's going on? Um, 
That young man right there was related to Buddy Holly and one of his early records. Uh, there was Charles Trammell on the right side uh, who was a major producer during those days of, of, of rock and roll. Um, I don't know what date this photo is and we've never been able to identify the entire group. Uh, and, and, I, and, and, and let me say without being dramatic about it, my dad was murdered when I was nine, uh, when I was nine years old in 1958 by a songwriter uh, in a dispute. And I don't think that even my mom had a really great idea of everything that was in his head. And because of that, we've spent our entire lives putting pieces together. Uh, one of the things about industry back in those days is that uh, almost nobody sat down and did a business plan. And for my dad, who was constantly, constantly, constantly thinking about the next thing to do, sometimes it just wasn't fair. Uh, and, and, and we just couldn't go back to it. Uh, this is just a group of folks in the, in the shop. Uh, the significance of this picture is that in the early days, you were allowed to listen to a record before you took it home. Yes. <laughs> I and, think you must remember those days. <laughs> and, and, and that was incredibly popular in, in those days, to be able to listen to a record first uh, that's Muhammad Ali uh, mm -hmm. in in the early '60s. Uh, after my dad died, but but when my stepmother was was running the shop after that. Um, there, uh, this is uh, this interesting group uh, was responsible one night for us having five thousand. And I say us only because I'm a dolphin, mm -hmm. not because I had anything to do with it. <laughs> uh, was was responsible for us having 5,000 kids in front of the store on a Saturday night where the LAPD had to shut down the streets because of the kids. This group is the Esquires. Mm. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. See, that's what happens when all this is here. This group was the Penguins. And uh, the young man, the, sec the, well, the second young man, there was the third man, but the second young man uh, was Jesse Belvin. And Jesse Belvin did a story many, many years ago um, working with my dad. And, and my dad was thinking about Jesse Belvin becoming an independent artist. And some people may remember that Jesse Belvin uh, did the two songs uh, because he was going to be the answer to Nat King Cole. He was going to be the more rhythm and blues guy to, to Nat King Cole. And his, his biggest hit was Goodnight, My Love. Uh, and his second biggest hit was All in the Game, uh, which George Benson did later, which became a very popular song. Well, but Jesse sang in this group called the Penguins. But at that time, they were trying to develop Jesse as a single artist and didn't really want to con con you know, conflate the fact that he wanted to be a single artist, but he was in the Penguins. So mm -hmm. my dad cut a deal with a guy named Dootsy Williams who owned Doodle Records down on 135th and Central Avenue, in what's now what is now known as Compton, mm. um, and uh, so he he gave the Penguins to Dootsy Williams for Doodle Records, and with a deal said, "I'll do this for you if you give me exclusive release for the Penguins' first record for 30 days. I want to be the only record shop mm. in." in California that has access to the record. And Dootsie agreed. And that wound up with 5,000 kids in the street because the record was Earth Angel. Ah, okay, okay. Well, um, you know, talking about this group, the Penguins, uh, what do you think the impact is um, for older groups like this on uh, some of the younger artists that are coming up today? What, what do you think? What do you see as the impact? I'm, uh, the impact is there is 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 to kind of understand. Um, I always think about where you came from, where the music came from, um, and then and certainly music has changed over these last fifty years. There's no question about that, uh, and certainly has gotten to a different place, uh, and 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 the messages are different. Are, are quite different than than they were back in the fifties and sixties and 
probably all the way through through the late 70s before the protest movement started in the late 70s. But nevertheless, there, there, there are two sides of the business. And I think one side of the business is the artistic side. Uh, on the artistic side, being able to create this music, to sing about things that meant something to you, to sing about things that are important um, to, to, to life circumstance. Uh, you know, the things that, you know, good night, my love, the things, uh, welcome home, uh, daddy's home, those kinds of, that, that spoke to families, uh, spoke to relationships, spoke to love, uh, spoke to a number of those kinds of things, but they also were about realities, maybe versed in different ways, but the realities of, of, uh, home circumstances, the love circumstances, the family circumstances in that way. And then by the time we started rolling into the 70s, uh, particularly with the hippie movement, then songs now starting to take on some other things. But uh, the artistry and the opportunity has not changed much. Uh, it was not easy for those groups then, and it's not easy for groups now. The thing about being an artist is being an artist and not necessarily about being a business person. So all the horror stories you hear about people having millions and millions of record sales, but yet having no money are still true. Or what some people still don't see, I don't think they see clearly today, uh, being an artist and having a garage full of Lamborghinis isn't quite what you might see because there's a debt there that still has to be paid because the music business actually gave you some money up front, uh, but necessarily to give you all the money because somebody's it's it's like a student loan almost. You're gonna be paying it for the rest of your life in most cases um, because you still didn't really not only do the deal that talked about royalties, uh, that talked about access to the music that talked about permissions to use music um, are a little bit different on the business side. But on the music side and the artistry side, which I still think is just as important or, or incredibly important because that's what we listen to. And for 99% of us as consumers, we hear the music and then that's it. We hear so many other things uh, throughout the years. Um, there's still so much to know. There's still so much to learn. Um, but the music and, and the, the roots of the music, when we talk about people like, like Sam Cooke and Lou Rawls and uh, a number of other folks, you know, a lot of those folks came from gospel. You know, my earlier comment about gospel and blues being all about the truth, a lot of those folks started in gospel. Uh, Sam Cooke was with a group called the Soul Stirrers, which still exists to this day. Um, uh, and if you, even though they're doing, this is, you know, 2021, what the Soul Stirrers were intended to represent in terms of a sound still exists today. The Soul Stirrers of 2021 sound like the Soul Stirrers in 1952. The same way the Temptations of 2021 still sound like the Temptations of 1965. Uh, if you ever get the temptation sound in your head, you can hear a new temptation sound and say, that's the temptations. And for many of those starting off in gospel and having the opportunity to work with music that says you respond, it's not all about the practices in developing your art. Mm -hmm. The talent is, is, is in the response, the, the call and response that exists in black churches among um, among us is what starts to develop that and to be able to sing on a moment's notice, to be able to harmonize on a moment's notice and mm -hmm. to be able to get to that. So I think it still has a lot of a lot of potential for today and there's still a lot of groups who are still practicing that. The mm -hmm. music will always the music will always evolve, whether it's rhythm and blues or jazz or as or as Miles Davis mm -hmm. used to say, um you know, if you don't change, you don't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and when someone always says to me, oh, I love Miles Davis, I usually respond, I usually respond with, and which Miles Davis did you love? Mm. 
Okay. <laughs> there is Sam Cook in uh yes. in the there, there are a million pictures out there. Uh, mm -hmm, Sam mm -hmm. Cook in the store, James Brown in the store, Elvis Presley came to the store. Mm -hmm. uh, Lionel Hampton was one of my dad's best friends. Well, Sam Cook was also one of my dad's best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that's my dad on the on the far left. On the far right is is uh, probably one of the most legendary DJs in rhythm and blues history, despite mm -hmm. the fact. Uh, that he's tall and white. That's Huggy Boy. Uh, <laughs> Huggy Boy has a legendary history here in Los Angeles for breaking new groups, for breaking new sound. And, and on the radio every night, he was the most excited person you could ever hear. Uh, but he was thoroughly, thoroughly, you know, ensconced mm -hmm. in rhythm and blues music of the day. And then shortly after Huggy Boy, uh, came another white DJ on KGFJ, which is a black mm -hmm. music station here in Los Angeles, um, mm -hmm. was Hunter Hancock, uh, oh. who was just the same way. And those two guys were huge in Los Angeles back in the 50s and through the mid 60s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know, um, before we look at this picture, uh, what's, what's, what do you think um, black artists' contributions have been to the music uh, other music industry uh, genres. What do you What do you think? What's your take on that? I I, I think the contribution is when you think about some blues and some gospel, and you really, really go back to some of the older music that that's out there. You know, we took a little bit of everything. We took a little bit of everything in black music as black music was developed. We took not just the pain and the hurt, but also some of the context of where we are. It's when you start to do a little digging before some of these folks, um, you'll find that, that black music, not only from New Orleans, uh, and what started with New Orleans and, and and some of that music, which which took on an international flavor, you'll find some country Western artists in black music that were just absolutely phenomenal, except for the fact that country music that for a lot of the population in the early 40s, uh, we were not supposed to be doing country and Western music. That wasn't our thing. Right. But if you really dig, you'll find a lot of folks doing some country and Western music. You'll find people, Joy mentioned earlier, uh, mm -hmm. about a couple of folks from back in those days. And, and I'll tell you, if you get the chance afterward, to mm -hmm. Google Carolina chocolate drops. Okay. Uh, and you'll find some of that Appalachian music done by black people with a jug. If you, uh -huh. if you really think, aren't you remember jugs we used to see on Hee Haw? Yeah. Um, and a fiddle, <laughs> yeah, and a fiddle, and an upright bass, and uh, you know, spoon and washboard, mm -hmm. and it was legitimate black music, country and western music, because again, country and western music too was also very life related mm -hmm. uh, in those days, and it was very simple because you know they didn't have guitars and amplifiers and. Uh, and you know, sophisticated instruments. They did what they did. A lot of the fiddles were, and a lot of the guitars were made from pieces just, of wood and cigar boxes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but as we have developed those that music over the years, we have continued to grow with the music. Oh, okay. And as much as I like to talk about the old music, we mm -hmm. have seen the music evolve. And we've seen the music move to different places, but we can always we can always go back to where it came from. And I'm not picking on music, yeah. um, but I mean, I'm not certainly not intending to pick on any genre. As much as I love classical music, mm -hmm. you know, a Beethoven concert is a Beethoven concert is a Beethoven concert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Tchaikovsky <laughs> the same with with Bach because that music was so gorgeous in its time, and it's still gorgeous today. Mm -hmm. But it's also like we don't mess with that music in the sense 
of, of, of classical music evolving to the same degree of change. Mm -hmm. A lot of, it, it has, and I won't say it's evolved, I just think it's kind of grown around the same genre. We, mm -hmm. Black folks, when, when we look at where we started from those, um, from those days of, of, you know, singing in the fields where we had no instruments, yeah. you know, back in the days of plantation and slavery days, mm -hmm. we had no instruments at all. And then somebody picked up a, a, a pot and banging on a pot and it just went from there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't want to let it go, but that last picture that was up for the last couple of moments mm -hmm. with my dad, uh, the lady standing in the middle, mm -hmm. that lady is Billie Holiday. Ah. I sat in her lap and I had no idea who she was. Mm -hmm. And my mom teased me about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> I had zero idea of who, of who Billie Holiday was. But uh, in a I, lot of pictures when she was out and about, you could always know it's Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the mink coat was uh, one of her favorite things. Oh, the signature mink coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, signature mink coat. Yeah, that, that's my dad and that is, is, is at the stop. Uh, uh, and a couple, of those, a couple of those records that are on the shelf, I still mm -hmm. have a couple of those because every now and then I was allowed to pick one. They were 78s, but, okay. uh, mm -hmm. and I was two, three years old, but I have a couple of those. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, Michael, uh, I asked about the um, the different genres because I uh, I don't know if you know, I play viola. No, I did not. Know that. <laughs> I love yeah. viola. Okay. And just, and just thinking about, um, you know, the influence and that, that's one of the reasons that I asked about that because, you know, growing up uh, viola player, classical music, we did take a lot, you know, from um, other black artists as mm -hmm. as well. You know, the hee haw that you mentioned. You know, just starting from there, um, and and the influence on classical music mm -hmm. from all the black artists has been, you know, just outstanding. So, oh, thank you absolutely. For that. And and you know, and you just reminded me, I need to make a phone call. Okay, <laughs> Yvette, Yvette Machan Devereaux. Uh, is a violinist and a concert master, and she was the first black woman to conduct the LA Philharmonic. Ah. And she used to conduct the uh, Norwegian Philharmonic when she was in Norway for several years. Uh, she's a very, very, very accomplished uh, musician, and she's a black woman from Compton, California. Oh, okay, okay. And, and just a couple of weeks ago, um, and, and of course, I've known that for a long time, and Yvette is a very dear friend. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I, I don't want to say we take her for granted because I do know who she is. But but mm -hmm. just a, a, a few days ago, the LA Philharmonic did a very nice splash page on who she is mm -hmm. uh, and what she's contributed to the world of classical music. And I think that phone call is maybe uh, Antoine and I will squeeze mm -hmm. in a conversation with Yvette as well. Yes, oh, yes. great. I would truly, love truly beautiful person. Yeah, you would like that. I would I would love to be introduced. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh what about um some of your favorite current artists? Who who are you who are you groove into? <laughs> oh Kamasi Washington, the, the, the tenor saxophonist. Um and then maybe a little bit because I've known Kamasi since he's about 14 years old. Uh, and he was the youngest person to ever sit in the Gerald Wilson Orchestra. And, and mind you, the Gerald Wilson Orchestra was a very traditional jazz orchestra, but because Kamasi lived around the corner from Gerald Wilson, who, who passed away at 97 years old just, a, just five years ago, um, Gerald recognized his talent, gave him the opportunity to sit in with his orchestra uh, in traditional jazz. But Kamasi is also part of a hip hop generation yeah. and has worked with a number of folks. And Kamasi has worked with his collective. His collective includes Miles Mosley, the bassist, and uh, the Bruner brothers uh, who play bass and drums, and Thundercat, who's a DJ, uh, and who've done some incredible music uh, over these past years, 
and who thoroughly represent the transition of jazz to hip hop. Uh, Kamasi was also the musical director for uh, Pimp, Pimp My Butterfly or Pimp Butterfly. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize, Lamar, uh, for Lamar Hendricks' album. Uh, Kamasi did do the music for that. He did was a musical arranger for a couple of things by uh, by Snoop Dogg as well, and has worked with a lot of folks. Uh, he is an incredibly amazing, amazing, talented young man, and who's who has figured out how to bridge the hip hop generation, which Kamasi is is a part of, and the the traditional jazz. Uh, generation because he was also a part of that growing up because it was literally around the corner from his house and his dad is a very respected uh, saxophonist as well. Um, and he's figured out how to do that. His concerts are um, experiences. I, I can tell you if it, it, sitting at a Kamasi Washington is, is, is an experience. And if anyone's interested, he is doing a concert at the Hollywood Bowl this season. I believe it's sometime in August. Um, and knowing Kamasi like I do, there will probably be 15 musicians, including some vocalists mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and Kamasi is one of those. Another, the two others are Robert Glasper, uh, the pianist, and uh, Terrace Martin, uh, who is an alto saxophonist, rapist, pianist, um, in fact, we hosted uh, them uh, not too long ago for our virtual version of the Central Avenue Jazz Festival. Um, that was quite an amazing experience. But they come from that world. You can hear it in their music. Uh, you can hear both sides of it in their music. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the really important thing uh, I, that I do know, both Robert and Terrace Martin and Kamasi, Mm -hmm. They started off listening to those people that we think of as the, as the bedrock of traditional jazz, the mm -hmm. Miles Davises and the Gerald Wilsons, and even the John Coltrane and the Dexter Gordons. They mm -hmm. did listen to them as well. They just didn't start off as they were on their own. Uh, so it is pretty incredible. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, do we have any more pictures, uh, Joy? I want to hear more history. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, as well. This this <laughs> this picture is uh, from an album cover. Uh, there's been a whole series of records that have been released, and these are after my dad died. Uh, my dad doing this. There there have been so many tributes to my dad. I sometimes think. I wish he had seen this tribute to him. Yeah. Uh, because they've caught us all by surprise, especially yeah. uh, these last few years because of the play that my nephew produced, uh, mm -hmm. because of this history. Uh, just a month or so ago, uh, Los Angeles, I just happened to have it here. I didn't pull it. Okay. Uh, I just happened to have it here. Uh, there's a tribute that Los Angeles yeah. put together called, called the Art Walk. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's around that whole Central Avenue history of the Dunbar Hotel. And one of the things they did on this art walk is they put a permanent art installation uh, to Dolphins of Hollywood and to my dad. Uh, there's permanent art installation. Let's see, which way? This way. Uh, permanent art installation. And they just renamed, just renamed uh, recently the corner of Vernon and Central Dolphins of Hollywood Square. Wow. And that, all of this just totally blows my mind. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I did not start doing this. Okay. Because of Dolphins of Hollywood. I didn't start talking about it. Mm -hmm. I started talking about all of this because it's Central Avenue, because it's our history. Mm -hmm, that whole mm -hmm. Central Avenue thing, uh, the fact that Big Mama Thornton originally okay. recorded Dolphins. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how you found that, Joy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you find uh, <laughs> um, you know, all of those things that have happened and because what I saw was, was a need for us to talk more about 
what our history is in Los Angeles. I've said a million times, Los Angeles is the capital of forgetting. And if that is the case, it's nobody's fault but ours. Uh, and I think that became my motivation because we do need to talk about it more. We need to talk about who we are in Los Angeles. We have not done that well. Um, and our history is so, so, so deep. Uh, when, when Big Mama Thornton did, uh, when Big Mama Thornton did Hound Dog, and it was written by two little guys who went to Jefferson High School. I'm not Jefferson. I'm sorry, not Jeff. Two little Jewish guys who went to L.A. High School, named Mike Stoller uh, and Jerry Lieber who became two of the most significant songwriters in rhythm and blues. They wrote almost every hit that the Drifters did. They wrote songs for Peggy Lee. And if you Google Lieber and Stoller, you will find a list of credits that's a mile long for all the rhythm and blues records that they wrote. They wrote Stand By Me. They wrote Spanish Harlem. They wrote uh, Smokey Joe's Cafe for the Olympic. They wrote all of these songs. And they're wonderful, wonderful guys. They said to me once, and I did get a chance, though they were much older when I finally got a chance to sit with them. And I said, how did you guys do that? And they said, we hung out on Central Avenue because we wanted to find out where the real music was, even though sometimes the police would run us out from Central Avenue because we were two little Jewish white boys on Central Avenue. But we loved the music. And we wanted to contribute to the music. So when they wrote Hound Dog, which is one of their absolutely first records for Big Mama Thornton, because they thought she could deliver it in the way they wanted it to be done. And then when they partnered with Johnny Otis to produce the record, that became one of the major, major significant catalysts of a lot of things that happened on Central Avenue following that period. So there are a number of these things that go back, they go back. Charles Brown on Central Avenue and working with Central, working with Johnny Otis. And Ray Charles left Seattle, Washington to come to Los Angeles and Central Avenue so he could listen to Charles Brown. So he could learn what Charles Brown was doing and back in those days. And those of you who remember the two biggest Christmas songs in the world, Please Come Home for Christmas. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and the other one is Merry Christmas Baby. Uh -huh. That had been sampled by me, including the, the Eagles and a number of others. Charles oh. Brown wrote those records in 1947 and 1948 on Central Avenue. Uh -huh. And guess, and, and, and so the, the key point there is Central Avenue and we need to talk about Central Avenue. We talk about New Orleans, we talk about Harlem. We don't talk enough about Central Avenue. The, uh -huh. the stories are, the, the stories are, are just limitless. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate, I've been fortunate to, to sit with a number of those folks, mm -hmm. even at their advanced ages, and to get it, you know, this time, you know, sometimes they say you can read the book and to get it from the horse's mouth. Yes. To be able to get some of these stories from some of the horse's mouth has been the joy of my life. Yes. Oh, wow. Michael, this is excellent. And I know we do have a video, so we'll play that uh, a okay. little bit later. But um, I do want to thank you so much for sharing some phenomenal information related to Black Music Appreciation Month. Michael, and for those of you, who submitted questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we answered most of them from the chat. Uh, remember to visit us at www.aarp.org forward slash BMM to learn more and register for all of the opportunities for the month. So thank you so much. And let's hear our video. <laughs> thank you too. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for everyone who was interested. Yes, lots of interest. <laughs> I think it's about to play. 
Tell us who, Michael. This is Big Mama Thornton. Yes. Uh, that, that photo is not Big Mama Thornton. She was right. not that belt. Um, but these are photos from, from that day. Big Mama Thornton, the original, uh, the original version of uh, this toad. And by the way, uh, to the day she died, uh, she died a little bitter because Elvis had such a great hit with the song and she always felt that she was do more. Uh, um, but it is one of those things in the tragedy of being black in America in the fifties. This is Hound Dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we're having some audio issues. So um, we will uh, leave the link in the comments there you and go. Yes. listen to it as you hear the interview. So, um, but I will, Back to you, Juanita, and thank you, Michael, on behalf of the team here at AARP. I'm the disembodied voice over here in the, <laughs> this is joy, but um, I'll, I'll kick it back to you all. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joy. Uh, Michael, in, any parting words that you wanna share with us, the history your family has done uh, here in LA um, and probably across <laughs> the nation based on the impact, you know. So any, any parting words that you want to um, share with us? You know, the, one, of, one of the things about, and, and one of the things I love about being able to do these things, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I gave a lecture at a high school once, and uh, not at high school, it actually was at the uh, Hollywood Music Academy, and a number of their Students are foreign students at the University of Music in Hollywood. And, and during the lecture, I, I played some of these, these pieces and there was so much interest at the end. And, and, and I said to the young person, I said, I am incredibly amazed that you're interested in this music. And this young lady said to me, she said, we have never heard this music. And I said, oh my goodness. She says, they don't play this music on the radio anymore which is true, except for, you know, you can catch Bill Gardner's show on KPFK. It's on two hours a week uh, out of entire week. And there may be a couple out there. She says, we never hear this music. So we don't get the opportunity to understand it. And someone said to her, oh, well, you know, you can find anything on the internet. You can find anything on YouTube. And she immediately responded, at first, you need to know it's there. So I think the opportunity for us to do to do this is to be able to tell people that it's there. Uh, yes. And with, and with a little bit of Googling, you can really <laughs> find a lot of incredible things about this music and about mm -hmm. this history, whether it's Dolphins of Hollywood. Uh, I love the Dolphins of Hollywood Wikipedia page because there are lots of links in it. Mm -hmm. But you can also do the Lieber and Stoller Wikipedia page, and there are lots of links in it. And the same thing with Sam Cooke. Oh, by the way, I'll leave you with one secret uh, that maybe some people don't know. Of course, there are a million of them. But if you're a, a Sam Cooke fan, mm -hmm. almost everybody knows the song, Bring It Home To Me. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you ever change your mind about leaving me behind, bring it on home to me. Mm -hmm. The next time you listen to the record, <clears throat> you'll note that when he sings the refrain, bring it on home to me, that mm -hmm. it's a duet, that there's someone else singing with him. And we all know that. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you probably have not listened to the voice. You've only listened to the fact that it's a duet. Okay. If, you, if you use your ears to kind of segregate that second voice, mm -hmm. the second voice was Blue Walls. Ah. And, and okay. we do, and, and I'm sure almost everyone knows Lou Rawls' voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the reason Lou Rawls did not get credit on that song was because Lou Rawls was also in a gospel group. Uh, Lou Rawls was in the Pilgrim Travelers mm -hmm. uh, at the time, and Sam Cooke had just recently left the Soul Stirs. Oh. And so Lou Rawls was not supposed to be singing secular music. Ah, he hadn't crossed that bridge yet, so he never got credit for singing on the song. But he and Sam had been great friends during their history with mm -hmm. and traveling together and being on bills together and being at gospel concerts together with the Soul Stirs and the Pilgrim Travelers. 
which is a whole nother thing about black music that mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. highly encourage. And those are two growths in particular. I yeah. encourage you to go on YouTube. And um, mm. there's a Sam Cooke song that, there are a lot of Sam Cooke songs that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. But one I recommend highly is look up Sam Cooke, touch the hem of his garment. Ah, oh, okay. Will touch you. I promise. Oh, wow. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I do see a question here. Is the Central Avenue Jazz Festival returning this year? Uh, we don't know about this year. We'll probably do something virtual this year. Uh, oh, okay. I've been involved in Central Avenue Jazz Festival the last 25 years. Uh, we'll probably do something virtual this year. It's uh, This is normally we would have it in July. But you know, there's so much contracting to do. There's so many other pieces to put in place. There's just not enough time to mm -hmm. do it for this year. Uh, but we did do it a, a few months ago virtually, and we'll probably do it again virtually. Uh, but I'm hoping to be mm -hmm. uh, in my happiest place on earth, <laughs> the Central <laughs> Avenue Jazz Festival, in front yeah. of 12,000 people who love the music. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you listeners for joining us today. We really appreciate you. And we hope that this has been some very good information. <laughs> and I think Michael really enjoyed sharing it. So thank you so much, thank Michael. You. Again. You and I'd like for everyone to remember to visit www.aarp.org forward slash BMM to learn more and to register for all the opportunities this month. So thank you once again. Thank you. Have a great day. All righty. Bye.